chasing down RSVPs, creating your seating chart, prepping a wedding day emergency bag. You've got a final wedding dress fitting, getting your nails done, and finishing all the last minute projects. Today we're getting organized and recapturing your sanity in a detailed review of all the last minute wedding details that you're going to need to take care of in those last couple of weeks. That's coming up next on the Wedding Planning Podcast. Today's show is sponsored by our friends at Zola. Zola takes the stress out of wedding planning with free wedding websites, your dream wedding registry, and affordable save the dates and invitations, plus easy to use planning tools. To start your free wedding website and also get $50 off your registry on Zola, go to zola.com slash WPP. That's Z-O-L-A dot com slash W-P-P. Enjoy the show. Hey there, and thank you so much for being here with me today, and thank you for sharing the Wedding Planning Podcast with your engaged friends and family and anyone who's helping you with your wedding. It means the world to me when you share the show with others, so a huge thank you for that. Today, we are doing a detailed review of some last-minute wedding details that you'll want to stay on top of in the final couple of weeks leading up to the wedding. Thank you to everyone who sent in questions on Instagram. I'm going to incorporate as many of those as possible into this first part of the show. And in the second half of today's show, we're going to do a really deep dive into creating your wedding reception seating chart, which is a last minute task that can cause some huge headaches and a ton of stress. But the good news is it doesn't have to be that way. So we're going to walk through all of my favorite tips and tricks for making that a really easy, really seamless process. Now, if you have a wedding coming up this summer or even this fall, then you're starting to feel the heat on getting things wrapped up and organized. Things like your final RSVP numbers, your seating chart, your emergency bag, your day of timeline, and a million other little details that snowball in those last few weeks. Even if your wedding is still months down the road, this show is perfect for you to proactively make notes about some of the things that you can anticipate in those final weeks before the big day. So let's start today's show with last minute wedding headache number one, and that's chasing down your RSVPs and getting your final guest count submitted to anybody who might need it. This is a really important step in terms of so many things. Your caterer is going to need a final headcount to finalize your meal plans and bill. If your venue charges per person, then this is critical information to pass along to them. It's also key to have your final guest count before you secure all the small extra details like wedding favors, place cards, menus, etc. So you don't go over or perhaps even worse, go under count and not have enough. Okay, so let's all agree that your final guest count number is really important to pin down. Let's move into when you should have all of your RSVPs in and how to chase down any stragglers who you haven't heard either a yes or no response from at your RSVP deadline. Ideally, I would aim to have all of your RSVPs in four weeks in advance of your wedding day. This is a bit longer than what you're going to find if you go out and Google this topic. Standard timelines run all the way up to two weeks before the wedding day, which I just do not think gives you enough wiggle room and enough space to kind of take a deep breath and not be really crunched and really, really stressed out. We have reviewed in past shows my thoughts on sending out your invitations much earlier than general guidelines suggest, and I feel the same way about the deadline for getting RSVPs back. I would really recommend setting that RSVP deadline of when you want a firm yes or no from your guests at four weeks before your wedding date. 
And honestly, if you just use common sense and think about it, I really feel that anyone invited to your wedding should know at least a month in advance if they can go or not. And of course, if there are special circumstances such as health or financial or anything else that comes up in you and your loved ones and those who you have invited, if you need to make an exception or two on a case by case basis, no big deal. But generally speaking, let's shoot for four weeks. And then there you are, four weeks before the wedding, that deadline date rolls around. And of course, there are going to be people who haven't been timely in getting those replies back to you. Hopefully, you've been keeping track of your RSVPs either via your wedding website. There are a ton of online tools for this, including a wonderful wedding guest list manager from our friends at Zola. Or, of course, you can also track this using good old-fashioned spreadsheet, a pen, and paper. If you're listening to this and your wedding is a couple weeks away and you haven't kept your RSVPs organized... It's time now to get organized. This is a perfect tidbit for you if your wedding is still months away. Use that as a lesson and keep your incoming RSVPs organized. It will save your life in those last few weeks. So how are we going to go about rounding up those people who have not submitted their yes or no answer? consulting your guest list manager, whatever tool you're using, you'll want to reach out to anybody who has not replied ASAP and gently and firmly and politely harass them into getting their yes or no response into you right away. Now, lucky for you, I would hazard to say that most people who you have to reach out to and tap and say, hey, are you coming to the wedding or not? I think most people, this is going to be an absolutely, we're definitely coming. I'm so sorry. I thought I mailed that card back weeks ago. I just found it sitting on my desk. Yes, we're coming. It's done. Your job is over. Anyone who you reach out to with a follow-up who gives a wishy-washy answer like, oh, we need to wait and see, it depends on X, Y, Z, Jeff is interviewing for some new jobs, so we won't really know until the week before, can we let you know then, et cetera, et cetera. These folks can be told that your deadline for a final guest list has passed, and if you can't know by X number of days from now, then sadly, you're going to have to submit your final count without them. Again, I will reiterate, I know that there are special circumstances that are beyond anybody's control. And of course, you can make case by case exceptions for those. But those should be the exception and not the rule. And this is another reason I really like the four-week RSVP deadline window. It gives you some cushion time leading up to the one to two-week red zone time frame when you really will need to submit your final guest count to your caterer, your venue, and anybody else who needs that information. And this is where we get into tricky territory. So let's say you make a handful of exceptions and you give a handful of people some leeway in when to get back to you, they might or might not be able to make it. They might tell you that they can make it, although that answer is not a genuine priority to them. They're just saying it to kind of get you off their back. So here's where I want to just have you use caution because if you do this with five or 10 people, you're going to get stuck with having to submit a final number without really truly knowing what that number actually is. So do you plan on people showing up after all and submit a number that's higher than your actual yeses because you're leaving room for those people who have said, I don't know, we might not be able to make it, but there's a chance we will. So you go ahead and submit a number that's five to 10 people over your actual yeses. 
Or the flip side of this is that you bank on some people, a handful of people being no shows, and then you lowball that number that you submit to your caterer or to your venue. I bring this up because I want you to be really, really careful here and stand firm. A deadline is a deadline, and this deadline has a lot at stake for you and your fiance, financially speaking. Best practice is to have a firm yes or no from everybody on your guest list a solid at least two weeks in advance of the wedding day. And once again, if somebody can't commit to attending your wedding because they have that many other things going on, I I don't know. That's a judgment call that you're going to have to make. But the bottom line is paying for guests who ultimately end up being no-shows can be a huge waste of money. And on the flip side, again, lowballing your guest count and not having enough table space or food available would be a huge embarrassment as well. So I'll leave it at that. Be careful, be firm, and be proactive about getting your final guest count in. Whew. Okay. Now that we have thoroughly covered your RSVPs and your final guest count, next up for us to review is your final dress fittings, tuxedo or suit fittings, and picking up your dress slash tuxedo slash suit or any other formal wear that you have designated for the wedding day. Now, your boutique or bridal salon or store may have different guidelines, but I would recommend doing a final fitting about two weeks before the wedding. And if you need to go plus or minus a few days on that, that's totally fine. This gives you at least a small cushion of time in case you need to do any small last minute adjustments. A listener who submitted a question last week on Instagram wonders about how she's going to get her dress home, which is a wonderful question. If you drive a smaller car and you have a huge dress, then the prospect of jamming that beautiful, expensive, and precious dress in the back seat is a little bit nerve wracking, as it should be. If it's an option, I would recommend borrowing the biggest car you have access to. And ideally, you'll want to lay the dress flat in the back with the seats down. Make sure your dress is bagged up completely, 100% covered with nothing exposed or hanging out. And if you can't access a big car with fold down seats, that's not the end of the world. Confirm with the boutique or the store, but your dress should be just fine if you have to fold it over in half for the duration of the car ride home. Also, be sure to ask the store for any tips on how to hang it. Generally speaking, you'll hang it straight up and down with nothing crowding it. So don't you dare move all your clothes in the closet over to the side and just smash it in the corner. It should be hanging with plenty of breathing room and it should be stored in a completely dry, dark closet. Again, ask your dress store or your formal wear store for any last minute steaming advice on how to get out last minute wrinkles, et cetera, et cetera. Another great question that came in and a word for those of you not wearing a wedding dress. A listener wonders when to buy pants and a dress shirt because they're concerned about changing sizes before the wedding. So my answer to this a month or so in advance, if you're shopping for slacks and a dress shirt, that should be fine in most cases. Although if you're experiencing rapid really, really quick weight loss or gain, you could wait until a couple of weeks before the wedding just to be sure that everything is going to fit okay. But in 99% of situations, I would say a month in advance to shop for those formal clothes would be just fine. And then what about all the other little to-dos that can pile up so quickly in the final week or two? I'm going to quickly run down a list of things to schedule and just be aware of for the week before the wedding or maybe the week or two before the wedding, depending on when you want to take care of it. And I'm also going to share some sample wedding checklists for last minute items 
on a Pinterest board that you'll find linked in today's show notes and also on our website. That blog post is weddingplanningpodcast.co slash details. So I'll go through these quickly. First off, if you don't have a dedicated wedding planner or a day of coordinator who you're working with, you must assign a point person to answer any questions and put out any fires that are going to come up on the wedding day. Next, be sure you have your marriage license. Check with your state for any details on application requirements, on expiration, so that you can get this on the calendar and hopefully not be stressing out about it the week before the wedding. A listener and her fiance need to get a marriage license from a state that is 10 hours away from where they live. Ugh, yikes, and it's right up close to the wedding. I would recommend that you call your county clerk and find out what your options are in terms of maybe applying remotely by mail for the license, or this might just have to be an exceptionally last minute task that gets taken care of in the days before the wedding when you're back in town in that home state where you are getting married. Definitely understand everything that you're getting into by asking all of those questions now, ideally in the months ahead, rather than putting that conversation off until the last minute and getting stuck with no options. So very important, call the county clerk or call the registrar or whoever in your home state is responsible for issuing those marriage licenses and be sure you have a full understanding of all of the requirements and everything that you're going to need for that. Next up, you'll also want to discuss and create a detailed wedding day timeline with either your wedding planner or a designated loved one who's going to be helping you out on the day of the wedding. Again, you can find a ton of wedding day timelines on our Pinterest boards, and I have also done an episode on wedding day timeline, so I'm not going to go into huge detail here. Another last minute wedding detail is you'll want to pack and set aside any wedding day essentials like makeup, jewelry, accessories, shoes, shapewear, your wedding rings, anything that you're going to need with you on the day of the wedding when you're getting ready and when you're going to the ceremony. Also included here is a wedding day emergency bag. Look on Pinterest for a million different checklists of things that you can include in an emergency bag. And don't wait until the last second to put this together. This is something that we can be really proactive about in the weeks before the wedding so that when it comes down to crunch time, you're not even needing to stress out about putting all that stuff together. And then speaking of makeup and beauty items, some quick beauty notes, I would recommend getting your nails done the day before the wedding. So that's kind of something that you do want to be fresh with, but I don't think you should spend all the time on the actual day of the wedding. It takes quite a while depending on what you're having done. So the day before the wedding for nails, I think is perfect. And then this one is so important. Anything like waxing, a haircut, coloring your hair, or getting highlights, that should all happen, I would say, five to seven days before the wedding. And (laughs) P.S., very important, this is not the time to try out a dramatic new haircut or a dramatic hair color. This is the time to stick with what you know you love and what you know you feel and look beautiful in. So don't go getting crazy with a wacky hairstyle that you've always wanted to try a week before the wedding. Stick to tried and true here. Another last minute wedding detail to handle is preparing tip envelopes for your vendors. I go into much more detail on this in an episode on tipping your wedding vendors that aired back on May 27th. So check that out if you missed it. If you plan on sharing a special gift or a letter with your spouse on the day of the wedding, then that should be prepared and ready to go. 
I can't think of a better <laughs> recipe for writer's block than being completely stressed out right before the rehearsal dinner or right before the wedding and sitting down and trying to write a meaningful letter to your spouse. So if that's something on your agenda, get it done in the week or two before. Next on our list, set aside any special decoration items that you've made or ordered so that nothing gets left behind when you start to pack up the car to take everything to your venue. Nothing would be worse or more heartbreaking than forgetting the custom napkins that you ordered six months ago or a special sign that you spent hours making or having your wedding favors get left behind that you and your bridesmaids toiled over for hours and hours and hours. So get organized and set aside all of that stuff in a pile so that nothing gets left behind. And to tag onto that, any wedding projects that you're doing related to decorations, favors, name cards, DIY printed menus, signs, anything like that should be wrapped up and done a couple of weeks ahead of the wedding, ideally at least a week ahead. This is going to be one less thing cluttering up your mental space in those last days leading up to the wedding. Here's another good listener question. She and her fiance asked for no gifts at their destination wedding, but now are second guessing at the last minute whether or not they should set up a gift table in case anyone does bring a present. I would say no. If guests do bring a card or a small gift, it can be put somewhere designated by your point person, somewhere safe, but I would not set up a dedicated gift table if you've specifically asked for no gifts. It seems to me like guests who followed your wishes and didn't bring a gift would feel an extreme sense of awkwardness and self-doubt if they walked into the reception and saw a gift table. So they would think, oh my gosh, we didn't bring a gift but now she has a gift table. Is this like kind of comes across as a passive aggressive sign? I don't know. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but my answer is no. If you didn't ask for gifts, I would not worry about setting up a gift table. And here I'm going to pause. I'm going to put the brakes on. That was definitely not meant to be an all-inclusive list of every single thing I would need a dozen episodes or more to review everything in detail, I would encourage you to visit the Pinterest board that's linked up in today's show notes for lots of sample last minute wedding checklists and also visit the blog post that I created for this show and you can find that at weddingplanningpodcast.co slash details. I'll give you a full rundown of everything we reviewed today because I know that was a lot. Today's show is brought to you by our friends at Zola. I mentioned earlier in the show that Zola has a wonderful wedding guest list manager, and there's so much more. Zola takes the stress out of wedding planning with free wedding websites, your dream wedding registry, affordable save the dates and invitations, and easy to use planning tools. You can conveniently manage everything online and in one place, saving you so much hassle and so much time. Start with a free wedding website. It's so easy and takes just minutes to set up. Zola also makes registering for newlywed life so easy. You can put your Zola registry right on your wedding website so guests can get all the details they need and buy your wedding gift in one convenient and beautiful place. Guests love free shipping and returns, price matching, and can choose from a wide selection of gifts at all different price points. To start your free wedding website and also get $50 off your registry on Zola, go to zola.com slash WPP. That website again is Z-O-L-A dot com slash W-P-P to start your free wedding website and get $50 off your registry. It's wedding band shopping time and you can enjoy the same top materials and quality craftsmanship as the most luxurious jewelry brands without the traditional markups by shopping with Noemi. I love that Noemi uses sustainably sourced diamonds and gold to offer you quality wedding bands that are guaranteed to be better priced than anywhere else in the world. 
and made in literally any size you need. Buying fine jewelry has never been easier. Enjoy free overnight shipping so that you can select a ring, try it on, and if it's not exactly what you're looking for, you have 60 days to return it for free with a full refund. I'm in love with my Noemi Diamond Band. It is so delicate, it's dainty, and it sparkles in the sun like you would not believe. I get a ton of compliments on it. The icing on this cake is that your shopping experience with Noemi is completely risk-free. Enjoy a lifetime warranty, free overnight shipping, and free returns for a full refund. Head to hellonoemi.com and use the promo code WEDDING for $75 off any wedding band. That website again is H-E-L-L-O-N-O-E-M-I-E.com with promo code WEDDING for $75 off any wedding band. Your engagement can be a really stressful time, and if you're feeling like your happiness is suffering, BetterHelp Online Counseling is there for you. Connect with your professional counselor in a safe and private online environment. It's so convenient, and it's perfect for busy, on-the-go schedules. BetterHelp counselors specialize in depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, family conflicts, and more. With BetterHelp, you can get help on your own time and at your own pace. You can schedule secure video or phone sessions, plus chat and text with your therapist. BetterHelp is secure, it's convenient, and it's professional. And best of all, it's a truly affordable option. Wedding Planning Podcast listeners get 10% off your first month with discount code WEDDING. So why not get started today? Go to betterhelp.com slash wedding. You'll fill out a questionnaire to help them assess your needs and get matched with a counselor you'll love. That's betterhelp.com slash wedding. Back to the show. Before we dive into the second half of today's show, I would love to share a personal story with you about the week leading up to my own wedding. Let me tell you, and I'm sure I've mentioned this in past episodes, it was one of the most stressful and nerve-wracking weeks of my life. And today's episode is really, really important to me to share with you because a lot of that stress was out of our control. However, a lot of it was within our control. If we had been a lot more proactive with all of the things that we left till the end, the very bitter end that we could have taken care of in the weeks before. And this is exactly why I wanted to share today's show with you so that the hope being you can keep that week leading up to your wedding as clean a blank slate as possible to leave yourself this mental cushion time in case things beyond your control just really fall apart. So the story that is pretty long, but I'm going to keep it as short as possible just for brevity purposes, we rented a private residence from an individual on a website. He was a very nice man. We met him in person multiple times, toured the house twice before we made any commitment to renting it. And of course, part of renting the property and securing the property for our wedding long weekend was giving him a cash deposit, which we did probably I'd say in the like four to five months before our wedding. And again, that's a very standard thing to save your date and reserve the space. Okay, so we give him the money and we don't think twice about it. We have a signed contract by all of us. The contract has been read thoroughly. It's airtight. We're good to go, right? Well, come the week of our wedding, we got married on a Saturday and we had paid to have possession of the property Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then we were to clean up and be out by Sunday at noon. So we're talking four days and change. The Monday of the week of our wedding, so we're supposed to move in to the property, so to speak, on Wednesday. On Monday, John, my now husband, calls to confirm 
hey, it's it's us. <laughs> We're going to be there on Wednesday. Is everything OK? Everything on the up and up. Is there anything we need to know? Just confirming. He never gets a call back. I am not exaggerating when I say that John probably called this individual at least a hundred times over the next two days. Calling, the phone would go to voicemail, no call back. Those 48 hours were awful. We unfortunately had to start thinking in terms of a worst case scenario where we had not only just lost $3,000 in cash, which is obviously horrible, but that wasn't anywhere near as bad as thinking, holy crap, we have 80 people coming into town for our wedding. And what are we going to do if we literally have no venue? So to say the very least, we are absolutely freaking out. Now, flashback to what I mentioned a few minutes ago. This is on top of all the other things that are going on the week before our wedding. All the projects that we still had unfinished. All the seating charts that we hadn't made yet. Much more on that coming up in just a few minutes. We're going to do a deep dive But the flowers had not been handled and confirmed. We still had vendors to follow up with. We had a million things going on that week that could have been prevented. And they could have been handled the week before so that, again, worst case scenario, and I pray that nothing this dramatic happens to you in the week before your wedding, But it would have been a little bit more mentally manageable had we not been juggling a billion other things at the same time. So I'm going to cut to the chase here. The morning that we were supposed to move into the property, this guy finally calls us back. And I will never forget I had gone in to get a massage and it was the most unrelaxing massage I have ever had in my life sitting there on the table and literally looking. I mean, it's horrible. I was looking at my phone every single minute to see if John had called with any news about the house and what was going on. And I came out of that massage and John called and thank heavens, he had finally touched base with the property owner who was, again, very nice guy when we met him five months in Rewind. He was an Italian guy and the Italian culture can be very, very, very laid back. And his response to John saying, dude, I have called you a hundred times in the past 48 hours. We have a wedding going on in two days. Why didn't you call me back? And the response was, oh, my relatives are here from Italy and I was showing them around and I just wasn't looking at my phone or answering my phone. Okay, so this entire situation did not play out in the way we ever in our wildest dreams thought it would when we booked that property. The good thing being that we did move into the house on Wednesday. Yay. We did have our wedding at that house. Yay. It was gorgeous and it was perfect. And I wouldn't change anything about the four days and change that we spent there with our family and our closest friends. It was absolutely amazing. The moral of the whole story is that I wish for you that that last week, again, is as empty as possible and that you go into that week working with as clear a slate as possible because you're going to buy yourself a lot of mental room and you're going to potentially save yourself a lot of stress when these unexpected moments come up and you find yourself having to manage things that you never even thought about. And to close this whole story out, We found out years later, we're celebrating our ninth wedding anniversary this summer. We found out about seven years later, seven years after the wedding, we drove by the house that we got married at and it had been sold to new owners long, long years ago. 
And we pulled up on one of the real estate websites just because we were curious to know how many owners had had it since our wedding and how much it had sold for and whatnot. And we looked at the public property records. Our friend who rented us our wedding house had foreclosed on that property in the months before he rented it to us. So he had been in default for the year leading up to our wedding. He rented us a house that he did not technically own. It was bank owned at that time. And the foreclosure date in the public property record is listed as July 19th, 2010. That, my friend, is two days after our wedding. We got so lucky that everything worked out with that entire situation. Renting a private property to host your wedding is an entirely different show that I could probably break into six different episodes for all the things to look out for. Another time, another show. For now, let's move on and dive into creating your wedding seating chart. I'm going to share a portion of a show that aired back in 2017 where I get really, really specific about some ways to keep your seating chart as low stress and streamlined as possible. Enjoy, and I'll be back at the end with a recap. Drill down and get really specific about some seating chart tips. So I have some general seating chart tips for you and I also have a really good listener question that is on the same topic. I want to open by saying that as you sit down to make your seating chart, and this is typically going to be happening right in those last couple of weeks before the wedding day, you do need to wait for all of your RSVPs to come back so that you have your firm headcount, you know exactly who is coming and how many people you're expecting. So this can be a bit of a stressful task for a lot of us because again, you're right down to those last weeks before the wedding day where the pressure is on, you're juggling a million other things. I do want to say that first of all, there's no right or wrong way to make your seating chart. This might be a wedding planning task that is super easy for you. Depending on your friends and families, depending on the dynamics of everybody, this might be like easy peasy, it's done, it's over with in under an hour. With that said, it also may very well be the worst brain twister game that you have ever played in your life, and it might make you really, really frustrated. So if you're feeling that way about your seating chart, please rest assured you are not alone. This can get a little tricky. With that said, my number one tip to all of you, whether it's easy or whether this is really, really an annoying thing for you. Do not overthink your seating chart. And I say that because in reality, people are not going to be spending that much time seated at their tables in their seats in the grand scheme of the entire wedding reception. So if you think about when you're actually seated at your table, it's going to be probably during the toasts and during the actual meal service, and that's pretty much it. So we're looking at maybe an hour, maybe a little over an hour. That is not that much time. So again, don't overthink this. I would definitely recommend assigning tables to people and then leaving it at that. I don't think you need to drill down and get as specific as to say who's sitting next to whom. Now, I know that's not possible in all seating arrangement situations, but if it is possible for you at your venue with the table set up, again, I would assign people a table number and then I would leave it at that. Common sense is going to go a long way here. So with, well, okay, with very few exceptions, most adults, most of your wedding guests will behave like normal adults. They will be cordial to one another and hopefully they will sit at their table. They will get to know their neighbors and have a great time while enjoying your delicious wedding meal. So again, on the theme of don't overthink this. Now, People who outwardly despise each other should obviously be separated. And if there is a burning desire, 
by your wedding guests to get up and switch tables or to rearrange themselves during the dinner hour because you have just put them at the worst table possible. Trust me, this is a worst case scenario. This is not going to happen. But if it does happen, then so be it. Please take my word for it that at that point in the wedding reception, you and your new husband or wife could care less. You guys have much bigger things going on, much more wonderful things to be thinking about than where people are sitting. So take this with a grain of salt, put the appropriate weight on it, and know going into creating your seating chart that, again, to wrap this point up, there's no right or wrong way to do this, and you don't need to overthink it. So let's go into some more very practical tips for you as you start to create the seating chart and start to kind of imagine where everybody's going to land at this wedding reception. The first thing to think about is do you have flexibility with table sizes at your venue? So at your at your venue, are you working with a set, you know, 12 top round table? Or do you have some flexibility where you're hiring a rental company and you're actually calling the shots on how many of each size table is going to be brought in to be set up? If you do have the flexibility, I would like to suggest that smaller tables are much easier to work with as you're creating a seating chart. So if you have the option to bring in more tables that seat less people, I would recommend that versus huge 12 top round tables that seat 12 people at a time. It's just a little bit easier to kind of group people by personality and shared relationships and shared interests and things like that. If you're dealing with four people, six people, or even eight people at a table versus 12. And then on this point, if you don't have any flexibility about the size of your tables, if you're working with 10 top round tables at your venue, you have no other option, that's totally fine. So to get started, what you're going to do is just start by grouping people in 10s or 12s or whatever size table it is that you're working with at your venue. And then let's go from there. My next practical tip and the next step in creating your seating arrangements, I am very old fashioned here. Now I know that there are apps and fancy programs and online things where you can make your seating arrangements and you can move everyone around and have it, you know, digitally and play with it on an app and do it on your phone. I I know that. I will say proudly that I'm very old fashioned here and I'm going to suggest to you that you do this the old fashioned way with a humongous piece of paper, a big poster board and some form of sticky note that you can just write names on and reposition as many times as you need. I'm a very tactile, very visual person. So to me, having this all spread out on a table in front of you and your partner makes a lot more sense. And it's just going to be easier to kind of manipulate and see things come together than it would be if you were trying to do it on your phone or even trying to do it on a website. So run out to your local office supply store. You can find this at Target, uh, CVS, a drugstore. Go to the school supply, office supply aisle, get a big, huge piece of poster board, and then pick up a package of little sticky notes. Now, a tip for you, I love using color codes to kind of categorize different people. So for example, with those sticky notes, if you can pick up a batch of you know six or eight different colors, that's perfect. Then you can go ahead and color code categories of people. So for example, you could have blue be for your close, your nuclear families. So the closest, your parents, your grandparents, any siblings, those could all be on blue stickies. And then your friend group could be on yellow stickies. And then the co-workers who are coming could be on orange stickies. Okay, however you want to break down those groups, those categories, whatever makes most sense to you. I would recommend, again, some just 
suggested categories would be breaking down the different sides of your two families. So you and your family could be one color and your partner's family could be another color just to kind of be able, again, to visually kind of sort people by common interest and folks who they know and folks who they're going to be most comfortable with. And then some other ways you could group people, again, friends, friends from same or similar friend groups, satellite friends, your closest friends. You could group single people together, coworkers together, friends of the family or friends of your parents could be grouped together under a separate color. So you get the idea. Again, this just makes it really easy visually to see who exactly is being grouped with who and then to kind of move people around however it makes sense for your guest list. In thinking about the flow of your wedding reception, if you are having a DJ, music, a live band, and a dance floor set up, you might want to consider placing the elderly guests away from the dance floor or away from the main speakers and also maybe away from the thoroughfare that is going to be people going from their tables from the bar out to the dance floor and back and forth. So being sensitive to those who might be seated longer than others. Uh, Again, elderly guests come to mind here where they may want to sit at a quieter table, enjoy a cup of coffee and visit with each other. Whereas the younger group, you know, the younger people at your reception will be out on the dance floor going to and from the bar and kind of hustling and bustling around. So that's That's one thing to be aware of as you're creating the tables that people are going to be seated at as well. Okay, so now you have your game plan. You have your seating assignments done more or less or you're in the process of getting there. And the next thing to think about as this is all coming together is communicating the seating arrangements to your guests. So a very common way of doing this is by using guest place cards. There are a million creative ways to tell your guests where to sit. And I want to direct you to a Pinterest board that I created that I will link to in the show notes. So when you have a hands-free moment, take a look at the show notes. I'll put a link to it. It's called Place Card Table. It's a Pinterest board with every single unique, creative, and fun way of showing people to their seats that you could ever imagine. All right. I hope that was helpful and I hope you are feeling confident and ready to go out and crush your wedding reception seating chart. If you have any questions for me on today's episode or a question or show idea for a future show, I would absolutely love for you to be in touch. The best place to find me these days is on Instagram and you'll look up at wedding planning podcast, all one word, very easy. And I love including your questions in future shows. And last thing before I go, I want to say a humongous thank you to everyone who has left a five-star rating and review for the show on Apple Podcasts. This is a tremendous boost in our ratings and the more engaged couples I can reach and help restore sanity to, the better. That is my goal in wedding planning podcast life. So again, a huge thank you to you for your time. I will leave a link in today's show notes where you can go to leave a review in 60 seconds or less with just one click. It is super easy. And again, those ratings really mean a lot to the show. And I thank you in advance. Thank you for being here with me today, and I can't wait to meet again next week. Same time, same place. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode of the Wedding Planning Podcast. For details on any links and resources mentioned in today's show, be sure to take a peek at the show notes on your mobile device. You can also head over to weddingplanningpodcast.co for a complete library of past episodes and to sign up for weekly show notes and resources delivered straight to you via email. Until next time, have a great day, happy planning, and I can't wait to chat again soon. Cheers! Cheers!